from God's Church of Love. This is Pat's Two Cents, and we are dealing with the word suffering. In, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it talks about there is a time for everything under the sun. And suffering is one of the things that there's a time for. You notice we have seasons of death, seasons of sickness. It's almost like a popcorn effect. One person, their aunt dies. Another person, their son dies. Another person dies. Another neighbor dies. And they're just dropping like flies all in the same month or two. Well, there is called a time of suffering. And it is because we live in a fallen planet, not because God is impotent. It's because we live in a fallen world, a world born and shaped. And it was born in righteousness, but it's shaping in iniquity because that's what we are, because we chose that route from the beginning. So we have opened the door for those type of attacks from the beginning, from Adam and Eve whether you believe in them or not, that's how sin entered the world. And now that we have to deal with sin, we also have to deal with the curse of sin, which is sickness, death, poverty, famine, war, hatred, all the works of the flesh that goes along with it, lust, per perversion, all of that goes. It falls into the category under the umbrella of sin. And we're in a season of suffering. Right now, we're in a season of suffering. And I want to ask you to take a reassessment of your life. We have to look at ourselves because sometimes what our attitude is, sometimes what our actions are, will determine how long the suffering lasts. Even in this country, if the leaders don't line up with God's ways and how God wants to bless his people, the suffering will last longer and it'll get worse and worse, way more severe. He'll have mercy on his people, but all of us have to deal with what happens on, on this planet. So what I want to say to you is there are reasons for suffering. One of the reasons, let's start with sin. Sin is a real reason for suffering. And the reason that sin brings about suffering is it opens doors to demonic activity. You notice when Jesus heals people, he rebukes demons. Most of the time, he's rebuking demons in the Bible. He's binding a rebuke and a sickness. He's casting it out, never to return. Telling the person, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. So obviously, sin has a lot to do with how some people get sick and have to suffer. There are other people who suffer. Sin has nothing to do with it. Jesus told the blind man, he told the people, this has nothing to do with him, his sin, his parents' sin, his ancestors, nothing to do. His sickness is for the glory of God because Jesus knew he was about to heal that man. So there are times when there's a season of sickness for the glory of God. And I'm going to share one right now that deals with a sickness. I'm going to read the story. I'm not going to be long because we have a good word coming. Where this is 2 Samuel chapter 2 and 3. And I want you to hear what brought about a curse, a generational curse that God pronounced forever. This is crazy. There are some families where everybody dies young. And you wonder, where did that come from? Sometimes it can be something that happened so far back. There's no way of tracing it because there's nothing that your family did. It's from way back. Now, 
if you have that bloodline, it can affect you as well. But here's the difference. When you give your heart to Christ, Jesus Christ and his shed blood reverses the curse. Remember that. He makes all the difference. But for those who are not following Christ, I want you to hear this. When your mama dies young and your daddy dies young and your brother dies young and your uncle dies young and your grandpa dies young, everybody in the family seems like they don't make it past their teens, their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, and there are no old people in your family. You may want to take a second look and say, you know, I need Jesus in my life. I'm going to share this story and then I'm going to turn the the floor over to Peter. First Samuel chapter two. We're going to start there. Father, I ask you to bless your word. All right. So we know the story of Hannah. Hannah was barren. She went to the temple. She prayed God would give her a son. As, as a bargaining tool, she negotiated with God and said, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you. And she took the son and committed him to the priesthood, to the, to the temple. All right. Now, he grew up in the temple after he was weaned. And he was under the leadership of Eli. Eli was the priest. And this is what happened. All right. We're going to start at verse 26. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Hmm. And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me? Oh, that is something that many parents do. Very dangerous when you idol worship your children and, and you love them more than God. You regard them more than God. You cater to them more than God. That's a dangerous place to live. Mm, mm, mm. To make yourself fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. That's what a lot of, a lot of ministers are doing, getting rich off the church. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, mm, I said unto, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. You hear that? Mm. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. There's the curse right there. Mm. Behold, wow. Okay, let me go down to verse 33, 32. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation. In all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes. Wow. And to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. You know, what's sad about this is in spite of all that God warned him of, he still had to go through this 
because he still would not handle it. He feared his sons more than he feared God. That's a dangerous place to be when people are your fear. When you're intimidated by people, their opinions, their attitudes, their actions, their consequences on your behind, rather than what God has to say. And that's the problem with most of this world. The politicians, the leaders, royalty, all of them, they fear the money. They fear losing their position. They fear everything more then they fear God. And that's why the countries are so jacked up right now. Money, 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 money. Money. It's all about the dollar bill. It's all about mass population control. Right? It's all about power. Esteem. Grandiose achievements and ego, pride, aspirations have nothing to do with what God wants out of them because they don't fear God. They don't regard God. So when things start going south, understand there are some things that occur in this world, in various nations, in various areas and regions. Why? Not because God is weak, not because God is a wimp, not because God is impotent. No, it's because God is fed up and he has removed his hedge of protection. But there is a remnant who live within the safety boundaries of God's care, favor, love, protection, healing, power, provision. And we will feel the ouch and the sting, but we will not be bitten and destroyed like those who regard not God. All right. Ah. Mm, mm, mm. Ooh, this is crazy. Here we go. Verse 34. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas. And in one day, they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind, and I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver. That sounds like famine and lack to me. Wow. They shall crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread and shall say, put me, I pray, I pray thee into thine, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. Wow, that's a sad picture right there. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter three, verse one. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was an open vision. Mm. Wow. Okay, now we're going to skip down for the sake of time. We're going to skip down. Eli's eyes waxed dim. Couldn't see like he could when he was young. And here Samuel is growing in strength, the anointing and favor of God. And he thinks God has called him three times. And Eli tells him, go back to bed. That's the Lord calling you. So now we get to the point where Eli, I mean, where Samuel recognizes he's hearing from God. Mm. Verse nine. So you get the, the feeling of how it segues in. Therefore, Eli said unto Samuel, go lie down and it shall be. If he shall call thee, thou shalt say, speak, Lord. 
for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then, the, then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. Whoa. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew it, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn unto the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. And Samuel lay unto the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Let's skip down. He finally, Eli says, come on now, tell me or else the worst thing come on thee. So Samuel tells him. Okay. Mm. Verse 18, and Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. And Samuel grew and the Lord with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Bathsheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. From that point on, everything starts going south with Eli's family. I mean, it's, it's, there, there comes a point where God has had enough. Okay. Now we're going to skip down. There's a woman that has a baby and she dies at childbirth. She's, she's from Eli's family. She dies from childbirth. I'm just making it real quick. So you get a quick gist of what I'm talking about. And as she dies, Guess what she names her son? She names him Ichabod. Ichabod means the glory has departed. The presence of God has departed. When God departs out of your life, you got, oh my goodness, this is such a dangerous place to be. Don't keep tipping. Don't keep slipping and sliding. Don't keep going through your little changes thinking, I mean, because... See, you may say out of your mouth, I fear God, or I don't want to get a booty whooping. But it's, it's listen, it's not just the booty whooping. There are judgments God can bring in your life. Oh, my goodness. And while you're tipping around and you're slipping around and you're sleeping here and sleeping there and laying with this one and laying with that one, and here you're called to be a vessel of God. And you're screwing over the anointing. You're polluting it with sin. You're placing yourself in a very dangerous position. Heed the warning. Repent and get it together. Because you have never seen suffering like God can bring it. See... God doesn't come that hard on people who are out there. People who are out there that ain't thinking about nothing. They've got payday for eternity. But when it comes to his people, they're going to suffer right here on this earth. Even worse, if they take God's favor and mercy for granted. They're going to pay even worse if they lead others of God's people out of the way into sin. You've got to be careful. You haven't seen suffering yet, you guys. We have been blessed in this time of, of our lives. We have been blessed. But some of you are right on the precipice. You're right on the borderline. You're right on the edge of the cliff where God could blow and your suffering begins and never ends. Be very careful the choices you make right now. Please. Number two, 
There are times when suffering is for the purpose of God's glory. God glorifies himself through you because you suffer in praise and worship. You suffer honoring God. You suffer giving glory to God. You don't complain. You don't grumble. You don't get mad at God. You bless and praise him. If you ever get to watch a movie, watch a movie called Love Kennedy. This young lady suffered. She never said a mumbling word against God the whole time. This thing will just tear at your heart. It's so uplifting, but it's a tearjerker at the same time. You talk about people's lives being impacted by a sick young woman in high school. Uh, how will you impact people's lives when you suffer? Will they wish they never met you? Will they not want to come around and visit you because all you got is complaints? about this going wrong and that arthritis and your back pain and your, your lack of money and God not blessing you and God forsaking you and blah, blah, blah. Or are you going to give glory to God no matter what? This woman sat down, this young lady sat down with a group of students and all the students were sharing their woes with their teacher. One had a daddy that wouldn't follow through. Another one had family conflicts. Another one had issues. And when she got to this one young lady, Kennedy, she asked her, so share yours with us. And she looked, she could barely talk, y'all. And she said, I don't have any. And everybody was amazed because of Anybody had the right to complain and bellyache, it was Kennedy. Oh, I'm not going to tell anymore. The teacher just said, okay, I think that'll hush all of us up. We have learned a lesson right now with her one word, none. She had no complaints. She loved God feverishly. <laughs> What's your excuse? Mm. And you can walk and talk and have your being, can't you? You may not have the money. You may not have the honey. You may not have everything the way you want it. You may have conflict. You may have problems. You may have crisis. You may have challenges. But look at how blessed you are. Nobody has to pick you up and put you in a wheelchair, pick you up, put you on the toilet. Nobody has to put a spoon to your mouth. Oh, okay. Anyway, so that's another thing that can bring the judgment or delayed blessing, if not judgment, delayed blessing, like the children of Israel that complained in the wilderness. You bring us out here to die? God brought them out there to deliver them, which could have taken 13 days. But their complaining dragged it out for 40 years. Stop your complaining. You have no idea what you're cheating yourself from. All right. Number three. Suffering. Suffering happens a lot of times because of other people's sin. No matter what you suffer, you know what the Bible says? God will deliver you out of them all. You will be delivered here in the land of the living where we are, or you will be delivered in eternity. And when you're delivered in eternity, baby, that's the best of the best. Hard for us to see it because we don't see the other side. We only see this. So we want all of our goodies right here in the land of the living, which is normal. But praise God no matter what. And when you can't praise him, ask him to help you through it. Ask him to help you. If you can't come up with anything else, lean on him for your help, for your sustenance, for your strength. Because everybody has to suffer something in this life. Nobody escapes. Nobody. 
Either you will or you will watch somebody you love suffer. One way or the other, there is no escape. My question to you is where will your faith be as you go through while you watch them slowly pining away in death, in the dying process? Will you praise God like my husband when he laid on that hospital bed in his bedroom and I played worship music and he's raising with the little strength he had raising his hand. That was his sign of worship. Raising and praising God. Or are you going to curse God and die? What are you going to do? Woo, Father, help us. In the name of Jesus, help all of us. Because nobody knows what they have to face. But give us the strength, Father, when it's our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Help your people.